if you come out with it. Great, we figured out recording, first step of this new technology. So now I'm gonna share my screen. Um, and so I was saying, my name is Monica Talan. I uh, have very, uh, you know, it's interesting. I have a very uh, unique background, I believe. I majored in journalism, worked my entire career in communications, worked at Univision, worked at AT&T, worked in other places. Uh, and um, during the pandemic, like many people, my bad joke is I decided, I, you know, I finished working Netflix, <laughs> watching Netflix. And so I started to study crypto. Um, and what actually happened, which I think it's a great um, example of how we really can take control of our finances, is a friend of mine during the pandemic asked me if I was investing in the stock market and I wasn't. Um, and for many people, Crypto is really the entryway into, into Web3, which is why I'm sharing the story. But I wasn't proactive, right? I had 401k, I had some savings, but I really wasn't actively investing in the stock market. So she started to help me to understand how to invest. She said, now that you're not going you know, to restaurants, to Starbucks, why don't you take that money and put it in the stock market? And why don't you invest in Bitcoin? The funniest part of the story is that she had never bought Bitcoin, but she wanted me to try it first. <laughs> So I decided I'm going to, you know, I'm going to buy a little bit of Bitcoin because you can, you don't have to buy a full coin. But when I went in, I realized that at that point, there were 9,000 cryptocurrencies. Today, there are 23,000 cryptocurrencies. So it was a very um, intimidating and kind of overwhelming space. And so I decided to jump in fully and took a an MIT course on cryptocurrencies. And there that's where I realized that there was more than crypto, right? We call it going down the rabbit hole. Most people come in through crypto, but then realize there's a lot more. And so I took the blockchain course also at MIT. And then I started taking courses because I realized the potential of it. And so I'm gonna start this presentation different than I've done others, but please interrupt me if something doesn't make sense. I always say I speak English, Spanish, and crypto because there's a lot of words and things that are not usually uh, said in either language, but um, it's actually the best way to describe Web3 is the evolution of the internet, right? It's not a different internet, it's not separate, but web one is when you could only read. Some of us might remember that when you could only read on the internet, you couldn't even put comments. Uh, web two was when you were able to, which is where we are now, where you could interact with the content, right? So you could read and write. Um, that's when social media is born. And so that's what we're living now. And I would say we're in web two and web 2.5 because you're starting to see some elements of Web3 coming to life. Web3 is when you actually can own your content and your assets. So again, you can read, you can write, uh, but now you can own this content. And what facilitates the ownership of these assets or um, is blockchain. And so I have this slide that describes it a little bit more. Web3 is a decentralized, um, space. So instead of large swaths of the internet controlled by one entity like Google, it's owned by many different um, servers. It's permissionless. That means that anyone has equal access to participate. It has native payments, which is where cryptocurrencies come in. And I hate this word as a peer person, trustless. But what it means is that you don't have to trust one entity because it's um, diversified, right? So the benefits are that it has decentralized ownership. It's resistant to censorship. So I'll talk a little bit about some of the myths in a little bit. Um, and then it's proof of identity. So it's going to be a great way to validate that you own something or that it's um, that it's really you. And that's um, allowed by, by blockchain, which I'll talk a little bit about more. Uh, the barriers is that it is decent. As, uh, we still have a centralized infrastructure. So I'm currently um, in Austin and there was a big conference on Web3 and crypto. And the big announcement was just how much Google is doing in the space. And it's a centralized infrastructure, right? So if you think about it, it's decentralization and centralization coming together. Access, 
many of the platforms, and I'll show you some of them, are not easy to use and are, are, are not that accessible. Some of them are also very heavy. Education, there's lack of, of awareness, and then user experience. Again, th some of them are really difficult to use. I'm currently participating in a beta to donate to a number of different projects. And the process is so, so difficult um, that I think that's been the main feedback, right? Just to validate your ident identity, I had to go th through, I think, a 30 minute process. So it's not easy, right? We're used to just clicking and getting to where we wanna go. Uh, but to understand uh, Web3, there's certain terms you, you really have to understand, and I'm hoping everybody walks away with these. Uh, and again, I'll give you the deck. But the first one is decentralization. So the main point of Web3 is that not one entity owns everything, right? So it's it really is decentralized and gives you ownership. The other one is blockchain, which is really a ledger uh, of transactions that are in a public network, and it's stored in a number of computers. That's why it's not centralized. So instead of having one server, you have all these different computers that are um, where the blockchain is, right? Um, cryptocurrency is a new currency or digital currency that uses cryptography and then advanced computer techniques. The main characteristic is that it doesn't depend on central entities like a central bank uh, to issue or control the money that currently exists in the world. Um, and that's one of the pushbacks that like Senator Warren has, right? That who validates that these are cryptos, that these currencies are valid, but they are again, trusted by the trust comes from the individuals who are really working in the space. And so for example, Bitcoin was the first cryptocurrency that was created. Nobody knows who created uh, Bitcoin because I've always said the person didn't want, or the individuals didn't want to get arrested. I've always also said it was a, probably a woman <laughs> who created Bitcoin. Um, but it's um, Bitcoin was created in 2008 as a result of the economic crisis, of the bank failures <laughs> that happened at that point. And it was a way for people to be able to do peer-to-peer -peer transactions. Um, it's grown pretty quickly, if you think about it. It's only, what, 14 years old. Um, and now it's pretty much used around the world. It has its benefit, it has its, its challenges, but it really allows you to do seamless transactions peer to peer. Many people use centralized entities like exchanges to do these, but it, it, it has great benefits. And, and I'll show you some of the things that you can do with uh, crypto and Bitcoin. Um, most people, I'm sorry about that. Most people come into Web3 through either crypto or NFTs. And an NFT is a non-fungible token, which is an asset that is unique and can't be replaced with anything else. So, you know, when a, a, a fungible token is Bitcoin, when Bitcoin is worth the same as the next Bitcoin. A non-fungible token means that that image or, or digital image is very different. Even if you have similar ones, each one has kind of their unique DNA. And so they're all different. Um, these are kind of one of a kind trading cards. What you're gonna to start to see is companies not use the term NFT, even if it's an NFT. So for example, Starbucks is calling their NFT stamps. Um, Reddit, I think they're also calling their stamps. You're gonna call see some people calling them trading start uh, st um, trading cards, but because they're on blockchain and again, they're unique, and they can be, you can actually see the value of each one and see the ownership of each one. It, ha, um, it has a different um, value, right? So you'll, you'll see, and I'm gonna show you some examples. And again, if I'm not making any sense, please let me know. Um, blockchain, again, it's, a, it's, a, it's truly a ledger. It's a linked list, link list of transactions and they're stored on a network of computers. They're immutable. That means you can't delete them and they can be viewed by anyone. Um, each block and not blockchain because you have different blockchains are linked through what the, is called a hash that connects one uh, block to the other. Um, so each one has a previous blocks hash and then connects with the next one. And this allows for you to create what, what is called a blockchain. Again, there's multiple blockchains 
uh, Bitcoin is a blockchain. The second largest uh, blockchain is called Ethereum. And I'm gonna show you guys something real quick. I'm gonna get out of this and you're gonna see Coin Market Cap. This is a great website. So like I said, there's more than 23,000 cryptos. Here you can see and blockchains. So Bitcoin has its own blockchain and the, the token used within that blockchain is Bitcoin. So if you can see Bitcoin right now, one coin is worth $29,000. <laughs> um, it's been going down. I think it went up to 30. It's, it's very volatile. Um, and by the way, the, um, I do have to say that I don't give financial advice mm -hmm. and it is very, very volatile. So sometimes, you know, it's been consistent, I think, for the last two weeks between 29 and 30,000. But a year ago, I think it was at 20,000. Two years ago, it was $60,000 uh, per coin. But you can buy a little bit of it and you can use it for transactions. Um, but you can see everything that is happening. You can see live data for, for the cryptocurrency, who's buying, who's selling. Uh, you can see historical da data. You can see news. Um, so you can see here, like the price, right? Where it, what it opened, how it closed. Uh, the cryptocurrency market never closes. So you can do trading 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That's why people become addicted to crypto <laughs> uh, because it, it you're able to do transactions all the time. Uh, but anyway, that's that's a little bit of it. Um, the second largest, as I mentioned, is Ethereum. And one of, and one of the things that the founders of Ethereum, the people do know who, who created this blockchain, is that they're the ones that created what is known as a smart contract. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna go back. Uh, a smart contract is what makes an NFT. It actually lists different things, uh, like a regular contract that tells you who owns it, how it's owned, who gets what when it comes to the NFT. And Ethereum was the first blockchain to make this possible. Um, and that's why it's um, the second most uh, valued uh, cryptocurrency. And then the third um, one that I want to show you, and this is Tether is one, ex one example. Tether is what is called a stable coin. And so a stable coin is like, um, again, like a currency, but it's pegged to something. And so this one USDT is pegged to the US dollar. And so people use these type of coins a lot for uh, remittances. So you can send money between countries and it's valued at the same, right? So in Argentina, people actually currently prefer to be paid in USDT um, or in USDC, two of the stable coins, because it's valued more in, uh, than, than their local currency. So you're starting to see a lot of countries use cryptos as their main form of, of payment or as a, one of the form of payments. Um, if anybody has any questions, please let me know. Don't don't hesitate to get off. Uh, and I'm sure you have a lot because one of the things I was talking to a friend recently is like, when it comes to blockchain and crypto, and this is one of the challenges of onboarding people to Web3, is that it takes multiple times for you to hear and learn about the space for, for you to really understand it. Because it's, again, I don't think it's that easy. At least it's not for me. Um, as I mentioned, a non-fungible token, they're interchangeable. Um, not fungible tokens are interchangeable. Non-fungible tokens are not. They are decentralized. They're immutable, and they're open to everyone. So as I mentioned, you can see the transactions. So here's an example for Ethereum. You can see every transaction that happens, and you can see the wallet. So everybody, when you buy cryptocurrency, you usually have a wallet and a wallet address. So you can actually see all of the transactions that happened in real time. So for example, Lily, if I send you 10 USDT, instead of sending you an email saying, or in addition to sending you a text saying, hey, I sent you the money, I can send you the image showing you the transaction. So you can see that it actually happened. And I don't think you can do that. I mean, you can get a validation from your bank but the fact that you can see it in real time and it's immediate. So um, I always share this example of how I sent uh, sponsorship money, $5,000 to an organization in Mexico. They got that money in less than a minute. I paid, I think 
like it was about two dollars in the transaction. You do have to pay some fees in, in, in the transaction. Um, they had it immediately and they didn't have to go anywhere. They had it on their phone. And then I could show that I sent the money. Separately, I sent a hundred dollars to somebody in Argentina. The organization, the entity that I sent it with held the money for 21 days. I had to pay $5 for that transaction and the other person had to pay $5. Um, and they weren't able to access it for 21 days. So you see the difference of why people are kind of leaning into crypto, especially for that type of transaction, because you're able to so seamlessly send money to, to other countries. And I think that's one of the user case, cases that you're gonna see really grow in, the, in this year and next year. Um, there's a company in Mexico, it's an, a crypto exchange that in 2022, they did $3 billion in remittances between uh, uh, Mexico and the US, which means that in one year, they took 6% of the remittances uh, market and it was all cryptocurrencies. Um, but a lot of it, again, I'm talking a, a lot about crypto, but I think what you have to also consider is that there's going to be a lot of user cases when it comes to brands. And so, for example, right now I'm participating in the beta for Starbucks, and it's really a cool uh, example. So they call their project Starbucks Odyssey. And the benefits for a brand like Starbucks is that because I'm connecting my wallet or I'm creating a wallet with them, they can actually see all of my activities on their website. Well, currently a, a brand can see if somebody goes on a website, how much, how, many how much time people spend in general, but you can't really pinpoint to the individual person. So you can develop a closer relationship with, with uh, an individual. So they've created stamps. So you have to, you can take journey. So for example, here they have a doing good project. You can take a quiz about all the great things Starbucks is doing um, and see if you understand it. And when I finish the quiz, I get a hundred points. Uh, I watch a video and take a quiz about their sustainable practices. If I get all the answers right, I get 50 points, et cetera. And so at the end of the day, what they're gonna do is give you benefits based on what you were able to do, right? So right now I don't have any benefits because I didn't make it to the thousand points. But if I had made it to that, I would be able to get a virtual coffee class, a passport or Feeding America donation. But again, for Starbucks, this is a test. They're just testing how people are gonna be able to engage and interact with Web3. As part of it, they also allowed you to get some stamps or NFTs. Um, they were selling them for $100 and they had like a time limit and they had a limit on how many people could get an NFT. They actually, then people turned around and ended up selling some, some of those NFTs for $2,000. So people are also seeing the financial benefit of participating in this type of projects. I obviously was too slow and I did not do that. <laughs> Um, but these are some of the examples. This talks a little bit. I'm going to give you guys all of this. I'm going to include some um, reading materials because we don't really have a lot of time here. Uh, I'm going to walk you through some other examples, but didn't want to show you this. Uh, I've included here a QR code and I'll show you what this is for. So on Crypto Conexion, we actually created, Crypto Conexion is my website. We created this section, this section called which has courses. What we've done is we've curated um, close to 200 courses now where you can sit, search and say, well, I want to learn about Web3. Uh, todos los niveles, all the levels, basic, intermediate, advanced, or expert. So I can say basic. I can say fundamentals. I can say I want the course in English. Uh, and then I Is your website only in Spanish? Sorry. The website is only in Spanish, but this section you can find content in English, Spanish, or Portuguese. So if you do English here, you can find courses in all of the language. But yes, our website is only in Spanish. We we did that on purpose because I think there's a lot of content in English, which we will you'll find some of that content in the in the links that are going to be in the back. Um and then I wanted to show you, and we also have an initiative if you guys wanna, and I'll put that link, I, I don't have it in it, so I'll, I'll add it to the deck, but we have an initiative called Wag Mi Latam, focused on onboarding 5 million Latinas to Web3 by 2030. 
And you can find information there in English as well. Here we have information in English and Spanish, Portuguese, or English. And we're trying to do everything in Portuguese as well to be able to connect with, um, with Brazil. Uh, so I'm going to repeat that just, <laughs> again, I don't give financial advice, but if you're looking to invest in crypto, the, what I recommend, number one, is that you need to do a little bit of research about the different projects. But yes, never invest more than you're willing to lose because it is such a volatile market. And then look at the different coins to see what makes sense, right? So for example, you can buy a little bit of Bitcoin, you can buy a little bit of Ethereum, um, and see if there's another cryptocurrency that you like. One of the great things about this website, which is why I'm sharing it with you because it's in English, but you can find a lot of this information on uh, Crypto Fun Extend if you prefer Spanish, is if you go on here, and I already talked about Ethereum, so let's look for another coin, um, Polygon. So Polygon is one of the um, blockchains that it's being used by most brands to launch their NFT projects. So the way that I look at many of these uh, blockchains, I don't look at them as cryptocurrency, but I look at them as if I was going to invest in the stock market. And so I research each project. If I were to write, am I going to invest in Google, Amazon, or am I going to invest in one of these projects? And I do the research to understand what makes sense. So for example, like I said, Polygon, is a blockchain that um, a lot of the brands are using. So then I look and I say, okay, let me read their white paper, which is not working on their website. I should let them know. <laughs> most um, So most uh, blockchains and projects have a white paper explaining what the project is and why it was created. You can learn about their, pre uh, their community. You can go to their Twitter, you can research it. So my, my recommendation is always identify what project you want to invest in, put a little bit of money in it so you can start to kind of explore what, you know, what the process is like. Identify an exchange and this same page lists many of the exchanges that are available where you can buy cryptocurrency. So Binance is the most well known. Um, it's having some issues in the US, so I would do a little bit of research between uh, before using Binance. And I don't think you can use Binance in every state in the US. I actually don't know if you can do it in Texas, by the way. Coinbase is very well known. It's US, it's publicly traded. So it may be a little bit more um, trusted by some in the US. So I would look at that one. Kraken is a little bit, another one, right? So I would research what exchange makes sense for me. And then, buy a little bit of crypto. If you're gonna buy a large amount of crypto, you need to find what's called a cold wallet. And by the way, anybody can follow up with me and I'll show you the process because I know we don't have a lot of time, mm -hmm. but you should move your funds from an exchange to a wallet so that you really own them and they're not owned by a third party. Does that make sense? Does that answer the question? Okay. Uh can I ask you one more question? Yes, of Once course. you move, move it into your wallet, from your wallet, are you able to move it to your, like, let's say, um, um, brick and mortar bank, like Wells Fargo? Uh, yes, and it depends on the wallet, uh, but yes, uh, for all of them, I think Ledger and others, you can do it. And you should, that's why the research is so important. You have to be sure that it works in your state, um, when the exchange, and also most of the wallets can work in your state, um, but you should do a little bit of research before defining where you're gonna really go for money. Um, and then uh, I'm trying to see how much because I got a note saying we had 10 minutes off about five minutes ago. I'm going to show you guys a couple of things um, just for fun. This is um, OpenSea is one of the most well-known uh, NFT marketplaces. And so you can buy and sell and even create your own um, NFTs here. Um, and so I have too many NFTs, I would say. <laughs> Uh, I became one of those that bought a lot of stuff, but you can see, so these actually, I won't talk about the blue ones yet, but like these are my favorite, where are they? So these I bought, <laughs> recommended by a friend, uh, and they're called Medashima and they're little robots that one day will be my companions in the metaverse. <laughs> and that's why I invested in this project. They have a really good roadmap. Another thing I love about Web3 is that people 
actually publish on their websites their roadmap. So what are the milestones that they're gonna be hitting, why they're doing things the way they're doing them. Most startups in Web2, most companies in Web2 never published a white paper or a roadmap. And so it really allows you to understand the different projects. Uh, but as you can see, OpenSea has a ton of them. This is another great project. This was created by a group of Latinos in the US. It's called Latino Society. Um, there's 9,000 pieces. So you can you can actually then click and see the whole collection. Um, they have hold on, uh, about 1,800 people that own the projects and each one represents a different individual from a different country. And so you can learn a little bit about each. Um, and so it's a, it's a fun way to also connect and build community. One of my favorite projects was created by uh, two Latinas. One is from Peru, the other one is from uh, Panama. Uh, it's called Search, and it's really a community for educating and learning about Web3. You can find free information and courses. Uh, they also have what's called a utility NFT, and it's called a utility NFT because it's not an NFT to collect and make money, but it's an NFT that gives you access to things. So they call it a passport. They call it the Search Passport. And it provides you discounts and information and resources when you connect your NFT to their platform. And you, I guess, if, my, if anybody's on LinkedIn, they can just add me as well.